So like you said, we're going to talk about learning outcomes and assessments. Um, one of the first things, yeah, I can go ahead and switch it. Uh, there's three overarching questions that we usually ask ourselves when we start educating or in our instruction in our courses. And that first question is, what do I want my students to learn? The second question is, is how will I know my students have learned it? And the third one is, what will I do if they didn't learn? How many of you guys have heard these questions before? How many of you guys have not? Yeah. Um, it's a really great way if you're going to start your um, courses, either developing a course or it's the first time you've taught a course. These are three questions you should have some really uh, good answers to. And we're going to hopefully help you guys find some of those answers today. When you talk about what do I want my students to learn, there's usually two things we hear. We hear course objectives or learning outcomes. And really, they can be synonymous with one, of, one another, as Dr. Hopes is going to kind of talk about his experience with it. I've called it everything from course objectives, learning outcomes, um, I can statements, uh, learning objectives. There's a lot of different things that we can call them. We're going to speak to them the way we see them in Canvas, and then the way we see them in our syllabi. Um, so go ahead, go to the next one. So the first thing is learning outcomes. And one of the best things to do is to actually define what a learning outcome is. And a learning outcome is specific, measurable learning expectations that you have for your students. And I think they're vastly different than our course objectives that usually we write down in our syllabus. So specific being, it is exactly what you expect the student to learn, and measurable in using a specific verb that aligns to the cognitive level, and we'll talk about that, uh, you expect the student to demonstrate their learning of that outcome. So a course objective for me is very broad. Usually my course objectives are going to be my course units. So one of the course objectives we might see in ADVS is students will develop an understanding of equine reproduction. The interesting thing about that course objective is we have two courses where we know we talk about equine reproduction. One of them happens in my equine or my ADVS 2190 class. I talk a little bit about equine reproduction. And then we actually have an ADVS 4420 class that is applied equine reproduction. So that course objective could exist on my syllabus and on that 4420 courses syllabus. So what does that mean? That's pretty broad, right? Students will develop an understanding of equine reproduction. So this is where our learning outcomes come into play. And again, a learning outcome can be an I can statement, a learning objective. Um, I've even seen them written down as indicators if you come from K-12. But it's going to be incredibly specific. So in my um, ADVS 2190 course, when I talk about equine reproduction, I'm very specific about what I want students to develop an understanding for. Um, you can go ahead and click it on. So in the learning objective, what becomes really important when we start talking about these is selecting that verb. So we're going to be very specific. I'm going to go a little bit deeper than just understanding what equine reproduction is, but also that it's something that I can measure. How do I want students to learn this information, which is going to tie into an assessment? How many of you guys have seen Bloom's Taxonomy before? Somebody explain what Bloom's Taxonomy is for those that don't know what Bloom's Taxonomy is. Those of you that raised your hand. It's kind of a hierarchy of levels of knowledge or understanding. So at the bottom, it's just being able to recall facts. And then you move up, you're able to use those facts and that knowledge to create something. Yeah, perfect. So I talked about those cognitive levels that you want your student to learn this information. So yeah, it's exactly. It's a hierarchy of how we understand something. And this is a really great picture. There's all different kinds of pictures you can look up Bloom's taxonomy with. What I like about this one is that each one is encircled by the next level. And really, it's kind of um, telling of you need to know something at the remember level before you can do something at the creation level. So some of my courses will exist with that remembering understanding. It's a 2,000 level course. So when we're talking about equine reproduction, we're going to be talking about it at that level. So when I start thinking about, well, this is probably the first time a student has ever looked at equine reproduction, I start thinking about what does that mean? So if I'm talking about a remembering level, a cognitive level, I'm talking about things like they can define, duplicate, list, memorize, recall, repeat, state, those sort of things. So I pick a specific verb, and that verb is not only important to the cognitive level I expect them to learn this information at, it's going to be really important when I come to assessing my student. I cannot only teach information at a remember level, but then assess them at a level higher than that, like an analyzing level. That wouldn't really be fair to the students. So if we click into the next slide, uh, the course objective, remember, it's a really broad statement. You may see this on both mine and Dr. Vanderwall, who teaches the 4420 course. 
But if you look at our uh, learning outcomes where we got very specific, uh, and then also some that we can measure, and I underlined the verb that we picked, in my course, I can identify, and identification's very low level, right? Identify person, chair, <laughs> teacher. It's very low level. Um, so I can identify the organs. So they can identify the organs of a mere reproductive tract, and they can explain what that organ does. Okay, so that's what they're going to do in my course. In that, in that applied equine reproduction course, I can demonstrate how to properly prepare a mare for artificial insemination. Probably pretty important they understand, actually, that reproductive track. Right? They can identify the parts, and we're saying we're getting ready to um, artificially inseminate this mare, that we know those parts of the horse, and then also the function of it. And in this course, they're actually going to go do those things. So the instructor is actually going to watch them prepare that mare. So a little higher level on that cognitive demand that we see in Bloom's taxonomy. Um, the other thing is, is as we, well, let you move into that, but as we start to think about our assessments, that verb that we pick to be specific and to be measurable in our learning outcome is going to attach perfectly into that assessment, and that's how we're going to see that students know that information. So the first question, again, was, what do I want my students to learn? And that's what I'm going to define with my learning outcomes. How do I know they've learned it? That's what we're going to do with our assessments, and then we're going to see through Dr. Hoops's evolution of doing his learning outcomes and assessments, how he has decided what he's going to do when students haven't learned his information via his assessments. So I came to work here at USU about three years ago. And as, as was stated earlier, I'm, I'm a veterinarian. I'm really good at sticking my arm in something and telling you certain things about them. So <laughs> I, I'm really good at that. But then I came to work here at USU and they said, here, stand up and teach. Stand up and tell others about it. And so I had a, a huge learning curve as far as being able to identify some of these things. And a year ago, we had this conference, and, and Kelly was the keynote speaker here, and she talked about learning outcomes. And then I sat down with her several times, and she really helped me focus on being able to tell the students what I expect them to know and do it in very, very specific terms. And so I started. And, and for me at that point, learning objectives, learning outcomes, I, I used them interchangeably, um, those terms. But then uh, they started a program called Instructional Coaching. And Erin came and she, she, well, first of all, I was nominated by my department head because I had been here for such a short time. And he said, we'd like you to start in this program to help with your, your teaching styles. I said, great. So we sat down, and the first meeting we sat down together, I, I listed three things that I truly needed help with. I needed help with Canvas. And I've been to a few classes here today where they're trying to teach us about Canvas and make it better. My viewpoint, my suggestion is just go have Erin do it. <laughs> she does it a lot faster, a lot better, and it looks, looks pretty good. But they have that that is available for all of us as instructors to have them up at CD be able to help us design our course and to get it looking and make it interactive for those students. So that was one of my goals. The other goal is uh, we needed to redo my testing strategies. I inherited a class that was, was really good, um, but the testing strategy was really old-fashioned, so to say, and we needed to change that. And then the other thing is I needed some coaching with my uh, teaching styles. And so that, those were the goals that we sat down and did. First of all, when we talk about assessments, the old exam was paper exam, you bring a Scantron in, you fill in the bubble sheet, all multiple choice. There was no variation in testing styles. Uh, the, the questions were not linked to any learning outcomes. I mean, how do I know that those students were actually reaching those learning outcomes? Um, and then how can I show it? Uh, the other thing that I was really unhappy with with the current testing style is it had to be done in class, um, and I had several students coming to me and saying, we had three exams today, so it was really hard for me to focus on one exam. So my goals when we sat down with the assessments, um, I wanted to move to an online teaching class. Go ahead. Uh, or, uh, no, not online teaching, but online testing, online assessments. Um, I wanted to have a lot of different styles of test questions because students, when we do it with multiple choice, it's, it's really good. It's a good way to assess, but we're really assessing are they very good at taking exams and 
picking and choosing and identifying certain things there in the question and not necessarily truly assessing whether they're, they're meeting those goals of the class. So I wanted to vary. Um, I wanted to have a, a longer time frame for them to take it. And online, you can open that up for several days. Then the student has the option of being able to schedule their own time and taking it in a, in a time frame that they would like. Uh, the other thing is we were able to, once we put it online, we're able to link each learning outcome to a test question. So that as they're able to take that assessment, they're able to demonstrate that they have reached that learning outcome. And so that was really uh, one of the things I wanted to, to do. Um, the other thing that we're able to do is identify certain parts of teaching where, I might, where, where the learning did not occur, that learning outcome did not occur. And so we're able to identify those problems, and then we're able to do some things about it. One thing that really changed for me with the assessments is my idea of what an exam is for. And that assessment is really that student's opportunity to demonstrate what they have been able to learn. That's what they're paying us for. They're paying us to come to school and us to teach them, and then we give them those assessments so that they can demonstrate what they have learned. And so that, those were some of the things that I, I wanted to do. And so as I went through, I had to differentiate between objectives and outcomes. And... We, I, I've been able to learn that the objectives are, are kind of broad. They're going to tell us uh, what we're going to cover in the class. They're going to maybe be in a, a specific um, reading that we're going to do. Um, they'll gain an understanding of this. You know, and a lot of my, those may be the objectives that we see in the idea forms. Um, those can be some of our objectives and how we will word them. But our learning outcomes are very specific. Uh, I also had to learn not to get too specific. Um, as I went through and in my first unit, I come up and I had, go ahead to the next slide there. I think I had like 77, yep, go back, yep, 77 learning outcomes in one unit. And I was too specific. It was, I, I, one of the questions was be able to describe the anatomical location using the term proximal. So the next one was describe an anatomical location using the term distal, where then I, I, okay, a better learning outcome for grouping all 10 of those questions together is describe a anatomical location on, on an animal using proper terminology. So instead of being extremely specific, I broadened it out. And I adapted. By unit four, I had 29 learning outcomes, and by, by unit 10, I had 23 individual learning outcomes. So it's a process. We have to be changing all the time in our teaching as we're learning, as we're growing. In veterinary medicine, while I was in school, they told us if it's a seven-year process, the information you learned seven years ago is almost obsolete, whatever medications, whatever surgical techniques, it's a seven-year process. So if you're not changing and evolving with time, you're not doing your students any benefit. You've got to be changing and developing. So here's one of the, how we tied the learning outcomes together with the test question. One of them was, uh, the learning outcome is identify the different types of joints present in the body. One of those joints is a suture joint. Those are the joints that connect your skull together. And so what type of a joint is it? Um, so that's the question. A suture joint is an example of what kind of a joint. And the answer there is a fibrous joint. That's a pretty good question because they've got to be able to know the difference between a synovial joint, a symphysis joint, a cartilaginous joint, fibrous joint, a hinge joint. And they need to be able to differentiate between those. So we're able to link that test question to the specific learning outcome. You may have several test questions with one learning outcome. Uh, there's a lot of different ways. There's a lot of different questions you can ask. The other thing you're able to do with those online testing is you create a bank. And I had one, well, go ahead to the next. All right, well, I'll, I'll talk about it there. I had a, one test where we had maybe 100 different questions, but the students only are taking 50 of those questions. And it picks randomly so that not every student's taking the exact same test. 
and it allows you to get feedback on each of your learning outcomes. That particular student may not be taking or being assessed on each of the learning outcomes, but the class as a whole is being assessed on each of those learning outcomes. Canvas has a pretty good online analytics with their testing. Um, you're able to look and you get a good distribution of what the exam, you get a, an average, you get a, the exam was pretty good, um, pretty good bell-shaped curve. Go ahead. Uh, you're able to look at each individual question. This question, what percent of the animal's body is water? You know, and 95% of the students got it right. 70% of the body is water. So that question, they answered pretty good. But what outcome was it tied to? I don't know. That canvas, canvas did not have that ability to link learning outcomes to the assessment questions. So I was in with Aaron, and Aaron proposed that we use somewhat of an experimental design or platform called quizzes.next and it was pretty neat. Now it has a lot of bugs that we're working through. Some of them, Aaron, Aaron was getting my exams up sometimes at 11.50 at night when the exam opened at midnight. <laughs> so, so we were kind of frustrated with some of them but overall it did a really good job. Um, but we're able to link these learning outcomes specifically to the test questions. This is, it's pretty easy to go in there to build your exam, to give the instructions. One thing that I really like there is we do require they take the exams at a testing center, and Aaron's able to put a link up there so that they can click and find out where the USU testing centers are. And they're able to go, some of my students live out of the valley, they'd come in every day, and it's just a lot easier for them to either go to Tremont or to Brigham to the testing centers. I don't care where they take it, as long as it's in a testing center that requires they have some integrity there. Uh, but you can give your, your instructions. Go ahead. The other thing I really liked is I was able to look at my lectures and see how many lectures I spin on each unit, then I'm able to pull that, that number of test questions. So the first section of that testing uh, scheme, we, we spent a lot of time on the first um, section there, so we pulled 14 questions. From the next two sections, we only pulled eight questions because we didn't spend as much time on that specific topic. And then the last one, we spent more time, so we were able to pull 14 questions from there. Um, we were also, go ahead, Kelly. This is where it got a lot of fun because up along the top was where we had our learning outcomes and they're tied to, to specific questions, and we're able to demonstrate that those particular students reached mastery of that particular topic. Um, and it, it gives you, you know, did they reach mastery, did they not reach mastery? How many students did? How much of your class actually learned that? So this was a lot of fun, and we're able to, you're able to go in and click on each one of those, and it tells you specifically what they answered and, and what problems they had. Go ahead, Kelly. Um, this is able to tell us, you know, this is the exact same question. I used it later in a cumulative final, and so we got analytics on it as well in the new uh, quizzes.next. But it's able to tell us the percentage of the students that answered it correctly. It gives us a breakdown of what they answered otherwise as well. Uh, this one is a really one of the good analytics because it showed us that 65% or 65 students reached mastery on this particular learning topic where 31 students didn't meet mastery. And so the question is discuss the six different types of nutrients. And so I had them list the nutrients and then I had them um, within the questions itself which ones provide energy. A pretty important topic when it comes to nutrition. Go ahead. This next one really shows us when we didn't reach mastery. This told us that nine students out of about 90 reached mastery when 87 didn't reach mastery. So what happened? We go back and we look at it and a few things could happen. One, was it, was it a bad test question? Did I write something they really truly couldn't understand? Maybe, that's where I look first. Second, I look at what type of learning was expected from that student. 
Did I deliver it in lecture? Was it an assignment that I gave out to the students they were supposed to cover, but nobody really made that assignment or did that assignment? Um, or is it a really complex uh, topic that they, they didn't grasp? So we're able to do quite a few different things with that. Um, I actually went back and covered that topic again because it's something that I truly believe I wanted them to know coming out of my class. So we went back and covered it. The other thing that happened is two weeks ago, I sat down with the other nutrition classes because I do teach equine nutrition as well. Um, we sat down with the other nutrition uh, professors and I, I was able to bring this out that said, hey, they didn't quite get this, this topic. And the topic being uh, identify where each nutrient is absorbed in the digestive tract. Pretty important topic when it comes to nutrition in our animals. So that we're able to identify where we can fix that problem is, is where I'm going with that. And this is a really cool concept of those three questions that we should ask ourselves when we're teaching is, what do I want my students to learn? And he identified that. How do I know my students have learned that? That's what this question was going to show him is, did they learn the information? And then what is he going to do if the students didn't learn it? And that's what this analytics helped you that ultimately is in Canvas. You can do this stuff in Canvas once you've created your learning outcomes. And what did he do? The first thing he did was, was it a bad test question? And that happens a lot. I'm sure you guys have been at some point taking an exam where it's a bad test question. To this day, I still see bad test questions. I just did an administrative professional exam, and I cannot believe how many bad test questions were on there. So sometimes it's just a matter of a bad question. And sometimes it's maybe it was a setting, like you said, where your students were supposed to do some of the learning, read the chapter in the textbook, and they didn't do it. And they need to take accountability for some of their learning. Or maybe you didn't do a good job teaching it. Maybe the accountability is back on you. And I think it's really important as instructors that we take a look at this data. And this is what we can help answer that third question. What will I do if they didn't learn it? Do I need to do something? Was it a bad test question? I need to throw it out, maybe reassess with a different one? Um, or did we need to talk about it with the students and say, hey, you didn't hold up your end of the bargain here. That's why we didn't do it. But if it's important enough, that they need to know it, I think it is really cool that Dr. Hoops went back and retaught the information and reviewed it with them. It is kind of our responsibility in some ways to guarantee a student learning, at least do everything on our end to guarantee the student's learning, which is really cool. And there's some answers to that third question for you guys. All right. This was another question that I really liked. You're able to put pictures in there. And you know, the question is, classify the tibial fracture and describe the healing process. And so it's an essay question. Uh, and yes, those essay questions do take a lot more time to grade. But they're, in my opinion, they're a lot more effective questions to ask on an assessment. And so we can see here that I gave them five points for this essay question. 38 students got all five points. 20 got four points, 24 got three points, six got two points, and, and seven got one point. So that's able to tell us the level of mastery that these students, and you can go in and you can designate what do, you, what do you figure mastery is? Three points, is that mastery? Four points mastery? Or is five points mastery? You're able to make that distinguish within the, the analytics. That was a fun question. I actually gave them that one on the cumulative final, the exact same question, and it was amazing how many students didn't answer it right again. So the other activities that really worked within Canvas we started discussion boards, and I had students um, have to submit sample test questions. So they were to look through the material, and I assigned them to look through certain sections by their name. You know, the A through F, look at sections one, and so forth. But those students do a really good job at coming up with test questions. And it helps me as a professor that I don't have to write as many or sit and think about as many, because I can cheat and use theirs. The other thing it does is it gives them a good study guide. But you can enable the like feature. So they're able to like each other's questions. And I said, whoever gets the most likes, that test question will be on the exam. And most of the time, I've already got that exact same question on the exam. But it's a, it's a really good feature that worked well. We started uh, discussion groups within the classes that students that were doing really well, I, I put them in the same group of students that were not doing well. And I told them that they had to write down in this discussion group what they did to study for this exam, how much time they were putting in on it, and what they were studying. 
and it really helps students to be able to learn from their peers. Uh, you know, the students that are doing really well, they're in there telling them, I'm putting in eight to ten hours of study for this exam. And the other student, well, I looked at the notes once, maybe. There's a reason that I didn't do so well on this exam. But it really helps them sit and look at it. We also started doing some weekly low-stakes quizzes. Students really like that. They love those low-stakes quizzes. And I would actually use actual exam questions sometimes um, to allow them to see what kind of testing I'm going to do, that sort of thing. I've really evolved um, over time. Go ahead to the next one. In, and this is my, my class for this fall. I went and I looked at the idea course objectives. And the ones that I have marked is gain factual knowledge, terminology, classification, methods, and trends. Learn to apply course material. Develop specific skills, competencies, and points of view needed by professionals in the field. Those are pretty broad course objectives. They're not even very specific for each of our class, classes, but we have to choose a few of those for our idea forms. Go ahead to the next one. What I've done is I then went through and I looked at my learning outcomes and I put them in some of those objectives. So where, where it says gain factual knowledge and terminology, that's where I want them to identify anatomical structures comprising the equine digestive tract. That way, when they go to take this idea next week, well, when they start taking it at the end of this semester and they're doing that evaluations, they're able to say, yeah, he actually did teach us that part of things. Um, and it helps them to be able to identify what that course objective and how it was, was made there. Okay. I think that's all we had, wasn't it? Or is there, oh, I, I even got more specific. And when I, I make study guides for those students, I even get very, very specific. So trace the flow of ingesta through the, or the horse's digestive tract. So they need to know in order where it's going. Identify the approximate sizes of the different organs within the digestive tract. Identify key components of each organ in the digestive tract. So we're getting a lot more specific with those learning outcomes. All right, go ahead. That's, that was the end of it. So any questions? Yes. I don't. Ma um, so I've created the modules, and I haven't gone all the way through. Have you gone all the way through Mastery Pass? Are you? Yeah. Yeah, we started looking at that. Are you working with her on it? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and we started looking at it because I'm a big believer in remediation, and basically that puts remediation in the Canvas course. You'll have to let me know how it's going, um, but I have not gone all the way through using Mastery Pass. I'll talk to you because it feels like I have to break apart my modules to do what I want to do. Yeah, probably. <laughs> That Canvas is not always the most intuitive, user-friendly. But it's that's yeah. why Erin's really good. If you're building a course or if you're new, go to Erin and let her do her job. She's put in my outcomes for three courses twice. <laughs> three times. Yeah. Three times. Were you um, making those graded discussions to have everybody participate? Uh, you... I would give them a couple of points. So it's a low stakes, but it is. There are points. Um, otherwise, it, it wasn't very well uh, utilized. But yes, I would, I would require that they have, a, there was a few points there so they felt like, yes, I'm accomplishing something and I need to do this. Okay. How did you start going about this? So you started with the course objectives, right? Mm -hmm. And then you went to learning outcomes specific to assignments, to the chapter, to I was. Studying? Yeah, I was fortunate in that I inherited a class and there was a list of learning objectives. And so I went from there um, that was already available. But then I went, and so I, I just developed it from that list. With my second class, there were no learning objectives. And I went down and I would go through each slide and I would say, what do I want them to learn from this slide? And then always look at that Bloom's taxonomy. At what level? Is it just identifying? Is it remembering? Or is it discussing? Or is it... Uh, you know, they're just, uh, you got to look at that Bloom's taxonomy. And it helps me when I'm writing my learning outcomes that I have it right there. And so I can look, where do I want this to fall in this scale of, of, uh, of, of knowing, of knowledge. And you probably have like a course description, right? And then you probably have some broad course objectives, yeah. correct? And that's exactly where you can start. 
is what do I want my students to know? So what are my course objectives? And it, I mean, you could see equine reproduction was pretty broad, and it actually covers through two different courses. So just start there and then build from those. That's a really great way. Always start with that big picture. Ultimately, what is the student going to learn by the end of this course? What, if I could guarantee something, what would I guarantee? And usually that's the course description. And then you'll have your broad course objectives. And through those objectives, then build in specifically what does that objective mean? And that becomes your outcome. Those become your learning outcomes. I always write them in an I can statement. I can identify. Um, I, it helps me a lot to write them that way. Everybody's a little bit different, but that's where I would start. Okay, what does my course description say? What's my course goal? What are my objectives? And then what do I really mean by those objectives? What do I really want them to learn in that unit with that topic? I think it helps as well to, when you've written a, a learning outcome, then say, where does this fit into my course objectives? Which course objective is this learning outcome fulfilling? All right. Yeah, and you'll have to let me know how master path goes. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. 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 Erin, did did we, did we miss anything, Erin, that you can think of? She's she's been very heavily involved with me in this whole process. Yeah, I think the main thing that we did, you know, with Carl is we made sure his assessments are different from what Kelly's are. Yeah. Kelly's students can go and they can demonstrate riding horses. They can demonstrate how to equip a horse with before you ride it. But Carl doesn't really have the ability to get them out into the field very often to have them demonstrate something. So it was tying that outcome to the type of assessment he wanted to do. So you have to really think about that as well. Yeah. yeah, it's really important the verb that you pick when you start writing those specific learning outcomes because that verb is how you're going to assess. So if you say the student can demonstrate this, they have to demonstrate it. There's other ways you can work through an assignment. Um, you can work through writing a test question to show demonstration or the learning of the demonstration, but it's really not fair when it is asking them to learn on a demonstration level if you're not assessing them on a demonstration level. We've reached the end of our time, so we can thank our guests.